A quick note before this week's episode begins. In the recording of this one, we had some technical issues, and the audio portion wasn't as clean as we wanted it to be. Uh, We did our best to clean it up, and I hope you still enjoy the show. Welcome to the Filmmaker and Fans Podcast. In this week's episode, we discuss the 2003 film Monster, written and directed by Patty Jenkins. Now, this is a very special episode because our co-host Stephen Bernstein was actually the cinematographer on this award-winning film, and we explore topics such as the importance of collaboration in film, the balance between realism and cinematic storytelling, and the role of cinematography in enhancing the emotional impact of the film. This uh, this is a big one. <laughs> uh, Monster is the film that we will be talking about. Uh, up to this point, and I don't know if we've been clear about this, but you so you've picked all these films so far. You, you actually picked all six that we're going to be talking about here. But this one, out of the mix, Monster, is uh, the film or the only other film in this this kind of mix that you actually had a very significant personal contribution to. You were uh, you were the cinematographer on this film. And because of that, I, I, I kind of went about this one a little different. I, I prepped, I, I did all the things and have the questions, but I'm also, I'm really curious where you would like to go with this. So I'm going to kind of give the basic information of the film first. Uh, and then the clip that I picked, I, this was a tough one because, uh, I don't know, you're involved with this one in a very intimate way. So I was, uh, it, it was a little different prepping for this one, but I, I actually thought of maybe just watching the trailer as the clip for this one, just to give like kind of the overall idea of the film. Cause I think there are a lot of areas we can go to uh, from that just because it, it kind of shows the, the whole, the whole thing. So let me give some basic information real quick. So monster is the film. This film was released in 2003. Writer director was Patty Jenkins uh, starring Charlize Theron and Christina Ricci. The summary of this one is shortly after moving to Florida, Longtime prostitute Eileen Warnos, played by Charlize Theron, meets young and reserved Selby Wall, played by Christina Ricci, and a romance blossoms. When a man attempts to brutalize Eileen, she kills him and resolves to give up prostitution. But supporting herself and a new girlfriend through legitimate means proves extremely difficult, and she soon falls back on old ways. More men die, and Selby can't help but think her new friend is responsible. As far as tone, this one is is definitely different than the ones that we've talked about before. So we will watch the trailer and then get into all the things. But before we start, any any thoughts? Uh, the film is not what is not about what it seems to be about. So people think um, serial killer. It's about love. I always wanted to be in the movies. Uh. I thought one day I could be a big star. You look good. Yeah. I guess you could call me a real romantic. Thanks. So you came? Yeah, I was around, you know. I thought I'd swing by. Men must just line up to be with a girl like you. I once heard this saying that's always stuck with me. All you need is love and to believe in yourself. Hey, lady love, you need a ride? It doesn't exactly work out that way. I mean, everybody's got to have faith in something. I touch your face. You're just so pretty. All I had left was love. So what do we do now? Whatever. Two more. My girl's waiting over here. I got you now. I got everything going for me. Life is funny. Uh, you girls. But it's also strange how things can be so different than you think. You know what I always wanted to be? President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? In my life, it's always been the harmless stuff that hurts the most. So where are you headed? We have to put the cigarette out. Let me have that. You don't know me! Where is the thing so horrible you can't even imagine it? It's usually a lot easier than you think. Tell me, that car belongs to a dead man. I know what I'm doing. And you're never going to understand it, all right? So you got to trust me. You never really know until you're the one standing there. You think nobody ever talked dirty to you before? I just like to settle first, you know? Me? Who killed that man? Who do you think? You can't kill people. Sasu! People kill each other every day. 
think that all these people just didn't know yet who I was gonna be. But one day, they'd all see. All right, so this is uh, this is a big one. I so I haven't watched this movie in a bit, and I rewatched it uh, last night in preparation to this, and it's uh, it's quite the <laughs> it's quite the movie to get into. Uh, but I have I have questions, and I have you know I have all the areas that I'd love to dig into. Uh, but since you obviously have a, a very close, intimate relationship with this one as the cinematographer, uh, I'm curious if there's anywhere that you would like to start before I start uh, peppering you with with everything. <laughs> I, I guess it's it's how I got involved. I was on a, uh, curious, I was on another movie, a uh, film called SWAT, big studio film doing the um, action unit, big action unit, 14, 15, sometimes 19 cameras. Um, every uh, tool that you can imagine, was producers like to call them toys, so they don't seem valuable. Um, we'd taken over the Second Street Bridge. We had lit a good part of Los Angeles with giant Moscow lights, which are these articulated lights that can light football stadiums. And we had 12, 15 of them. And, um, there were squibs, which are uh, basically little explosives that you put on surfaces. And then they're set off by an electronic signal. So they appear like gunshots striking a car. Um, we had squibs on bodies with the blood bags, the squib in the inside, the blood bag on the outside. The squib would go off and the blood would come out. So people getting shot. People with, um, machine guns with, uh, what's called quarter charges in them. So they make the noise and there's what's called a muzzle flash, which shoots out, but the charges aren't very dangerous because we're very, uh, most films very safety oriented to the big action sequences. We were landing a, a three quarter size model of a plane on the bridge, a jet. There were cars spinning out of control. There were uh, stunt people everywhere, a giant cable that ran through like a four ton plate that would pull the airplane onto the, uh, onto the bridge. A lot going on. And when you're young and you hear of something like that, you think, Oh, that's what I want to do. That's, uh, filmmaking. That's testosterone. That's validation. That's, um, you know, cinematographer and, uh, a couple day old beard and a leather jacket and, uh, headphones and hundreds of people you're issuing instructions to and you're empowered and you're creative and, um, life is good. Uh, but life wasn't good. Um, I was, for some reason, which I couldn't at the time fathom, I was uh, profoundly uh, depressed. I guess uh, there's only one thing worse than not getting what you want, which is getting what you want and discovering that that um, chasm within remained. And I did not feel a whole or present um, or together for whatever uh, reasons. But the money was uh, fantastic. Uh, the the adventure of it all and the educational value of being able to have access to not only the equipment, but the crew we're working with it was A-list, 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 big cast, Samuel Jackson, so on, Colin Farrell. It seemed uh, a good experience to be having, and I was having it. When a call came from an old friend of mine, Clark Peterson, who Clark worked on smaller films, but when I first moved to uh, Los Angeles in America from the UK, where I've been living for the past 20 two odd years. Clark was one of the first people to employ me and I always had a fondness for him. And he said, look, we're doing this film in Florida. We've run into some problems. We're behind. Uh, we're thinking of shutting it down. Any chance you come here and pick it up? And I, my first reaction was, well, that's impossible. I've got a commitment of a few more weeks. I've been on SWAT, I think for four months, five months. It was a huge film. And uh, I had a few more days to go and I didn't think it was professional to a band to film before I saw it out. I loved the team I was working with anyway, and didn't want to leave it. And he sent me the script and I read the script on a whim. I was just going to throw it away. And then I read it and I thought, gosh, this is odd. It's romantic, but deeply disturbing. Um, it's about people that I recognize and then about people who are monstrous, terrifying. And terrifying in a way that so tied to the real as to be more frightening. The one solace we have in horror films when it comes from the phantasmagorical is we don't recognize our ordinary world within that conceit. But in Monster, we recognized ourselves and people that we knew and life that we either saw or witnessed in close proximity if we live in any city. 
and we see homeless people and we see the disenfranchised and the underrepresented and all the rest of it. Still wasn't convinced because, frankly, the money was so good on SWAT and the money was, I imagined, was going to be terrible on Monstrum. I was right about that. And then Clark asked me to get on the phone with Patty initially, Patty Jenkins, unknown director at the time, not far out of film school. And Charlize Theron, who I vaguely recollected, was very pretty and had been in Cider House Rules and a few other films, but not someone I really knew except as kind of a very attractive actress of some skill, but not someone who was considered creatively significant, at least in my view at that point. Mm -hmm. And they pitched the project to me and they had a passion and enthusiasm for what they were doing. And I realized it wasn't just kind of a horror film. It wasn't a slasher film. Uh, it was something else entirely. And considering my state of mind, I went to the producers and explained that we only have a few more days. There's an independent film in Florida, producer friend of mine, really interesting director. I would really like to go and, and go work on it. And they gave me permission to leave early, which I did. Kind of regretted it because then someone picked up like a week's worth of work and they got a second unit co-credit, but that's the nature of our beloved mm. thing. And I arrived and they showed me the dailies and they explained they were two days behind, only been shooting for two days and they had technical problems and the equipment was not working properly and the film was scratched and it wasn't what Patty wanted and the collaborations that you're having were difficult. And I spoke to Patty and Charlize and Clark at length and we retooled. Um, we changed some crew, we changed some equipment, we took some time off, we reconstructed and we began working together. And, you know, Patty's a very honest person, let me be honest. It was difficult at first because Patty didn't have a great familiarity with uh, feature procedures. Um, mm -hmm. She would come up and be adjusting lights and I would explain to her, no, Patty, so cinematographer does that. But, mm -hmm. but that was a, a very small criticism because what I did observe about Patty was um, she was a force of, of nature. Um, very, very strong, clear vision, which I think is essential in directing about what she wanted. And that sounds easier than it is because there's so many variables in film. Performance, camera composition, how you edit it, music. And every mechanism we can employ is seductive. Let's do a 360 degree shot. Let's do a crane shot. Let's do a push in. Let's do some nice backlighting, whatever it is. Hmm. But they have to be unified. They have to be orchestrated for a scene to work. And Patty knew exactly what she wanted. Now, a lot of young directors will fake it because they don't want to appear insecure. Patty had a wonderful way of approaching those moments where when she was certain, she was certain. And when she wasn't, she'd ask for other people's opinions, listen to those opinions, and then make a choice predicated on the information that she'd accumulated. Brilliant leadership for someone who was directing their first movie and the first movie in any executive capacity. And Charlize was something different again. Really, in real life, later went to the Berlin Film Festival, um, the team and um, with Charlize. And Charlize was now all glammed up and frankly, one of the most beautiful peaches that people I've ever seen in my life. But that's not what she was doing on Monster. And this is more significant than you might realize. We all have commodities that we exchange in Hollywood. And uh, if you have a big resume, people are hired for your big resume. If you're a good writer, people will hire you for your writing. If you're exceptionally beautiful, whatever your qualities, other qualities, beauty is a commodity. People want to put a beautiful face on screen. It drives box office and she is exceptionally beautiful. Not a monster. She had put on a ton of weight. She had these old gnarly clothes that she wore every single day because she felt it got her into uh, character. They, she had these prosthetic teeth, which made her look awful. No facials, no makeups, filthy hair, smoking. She doesn't smoke much, um, smoking all the time and staying in the same grotty, awful, filthy hotels that the crew was staying in, um, in Daytona Beach and then Orlando, and really some very awful places to drive by, let alone live in. Uh, call it method, it was obsessional dedication to understanding the character as well as all the research she did. 
So this informed everything I did subsequent to this. I looked at their dedication. I looked at the research they did, their preparation, and their absolute single-mindedness. And I said, hey, if I ever go back to directing, that's the way I'm going to do it because these guys are special. And then something just magically evolved the next moment. I'll get into your other subjects. I'll just say this real quickly. A person with creative integrity engenders creative integrity in everyone around them. It's sort of like being near virtue. Uh, you want to be virtuous. There's so many films, Frank Capra and others, where the innocent appears in a film. And that innocent makes other people discover their greater quality of spirit. It's as if the, an exemplar makes us better people, that we live by other people's examples. Happer always had Mr. Deeds goes to what, Mr. Deeds goes to town, what Miss Smith goes to Washington, I always mix those up, and all the others. Um, you know, uh, um, it's it's the the innocent abroad in a cynical world, not being made cynical, but making the cynics reacquire their innocence. To be around uh, Patty and Charlize made me re-examine my approach to my own creative process. And I was looking at Charlize acting professionally in some scenes, and I saw her looking for her mark and landing on her mark, very important with lighting, because if you miss a mark, you're not lit properly. But I realized that she was a very intuitive actress and had completely inhabited the character to the point where she was almost channeling, come back to the scary part of that later. And I thought, you know, if the lights moved, then she wouldn't have to look for a mark because we could move the lights with her. So we got a couple of paper lanterns, three actually, put each of the operators, as I call them, of those lanterns with a, on a fish pole. They had a radio link to me behind the camera. And I would tell them where to go to give her a key light and a backlight and a fill light. And because diffuse light sources like this are very soft, you don't really see the shadows they throw and you don't really see them moving when they're moving. So she would always be illuminated in the way I wanted to be, her to be illuminated. And when I transitioned, like when she stepped forward in a moment of high drama, I would move one light away and then slowly dim it down. So as the drama of the scene increased, suddenly she'd be side lit with only one light, even though she'd begun the scene fully illuminated and the audience wouldn't even notice. And it would just feel like a visceral reaction to a moment of greater drama as one side of her face dropped into shadow so subtly that you didn't know it, but you felt it. The other advantage of moving these lights with her is that we no longer needed marks. She could go wherever her spirit guided her which allowed her to be more intuitive and more like the character and even improvise, at least with her physicality. Now, there's a problem with that in terms of focus because uh, focus, when you're using a long lens, tends to be only a few inches deep. You can only hold the person in focus for a few inches and you've got to rotate the barrel of the lens to keep a person in focus. That's what a focus puller does. And they have a remote controller or a cable and they mark the distances that the actor moves to and then as the actor moves to different marks, remember those marks on the ground, the focus will be rotated, just a, in a depth of only this much forward and back to keep that face in focus. But she was moving all over the shop now. Hmm. So I had my focus puller move off the set to the side and we put marks hidden in the set that only the focus puller would see and Charlie's wouldn't have to look at. So as Charlie's moved forward and back, the focus puller would know how far she is from the camera and be able to roll the focus forward and back to keep her in focus no matter where she went. Particularly in the first murder scene, she was in the car, out of the car, running towards camera, running back, running to the boot, the trunk of the car, running forward and going everywhere, going mad and crazed, doing things that were entirely physically improvised. We had her in focus throughout and she was entirely intuitive and genuine. And at that moment, we all looked at each other. If we didn't, we should have, maybe it's a hot roll. And we thought something magical is happening here. And so it went for the rest of the film with this fluidity. As that evolved later, uh, the camera was on my shoulder. No more tripods hmm. and dollies at times, but for the most part, not. And not only was she moving, but then sometimes I would operate. Usually I have a camera operator, but I would operate. And I would move with her in this kind of dance 
murder scene. She jumps in the car. She jumps out. I back up. She goes to the trunk of the car. I follow her. She turns and looks. I push in for a close-up because it seemed appropriate that we'd be a close-up at that moment. She looks around. She's frantic. She comes back to see the person she shot. We back up, and then we wrap around the car. We come around the other side, and we shoot through the window, and she's grabbing the body and screaming. We push in again and then back around for all in one shot. We cut it up later, but all intuition by the camera operator, the DP, with the lights, with the actress, everything facilitated because of the creative inspiration and leadership provided by a Patty who would go with this and recognized the ideas as they came forward and understood what she wanted and understood the sort of performer that Charlize was. It began with the integrity of a single individual Patty, then to Charlize, and then spread like a, um, a, a virtuous virus to all of us as we thought sought ways to facilitate what we knew was something very special. Oh my God. There's, oh, this is gonna, <laughs> there's so much. <laughs> there's so much. Um, okay. I want to parse everything you just said, but let's let's back up just for a second. Um, you we've talked about Patty, or you've talked about Patty Jenkins already. So let's let's kind of focus on that for a second. Um, I'm curious about creative collaboration. So specifically, the collaboration between directors and cinematographers. So directors and cinematographers often have this like unique and, and collaborative relationship that's really kind of central in shaping a film's narrative. And they have to work together to be able to do this when it comes to visual storytelling. Uh, so you've talked about it a little bit already, but can you can you talk and describe a bit about your actual collaborative process with Patty and how kind of that partnership influenced the visual storytelling uh, overall? It's a good and tough question because Collaboration is one of the hardest things we do in film. A painter paints by themselves. A musician very often, at least at the beginning, composes by themselves. A poet writes poetry, a novelist writes a novel. Film is almost unique. I make us dance and theater too, in that you have to work with a great many other people to realize the vision, whatever that vision may be. You have the added obstacle in film that a lot of money is being spent. And there are people who job it is the stewardship of those money, that money to make sure it's responsibly spent and the shoot goes quickly. Usually the person who slows the film down the most is the cinematographer because lighting, setting up cameras and equipment takes a lot of time. So they become an important part of that equation. That means they're not only interacting with the director, but with the producers and the production company of the studio who doesn't want their film to go over schedule over budget, which makes things very complicated. The cinematographer then has to decide who they serve, the studio and production company or the director. Very often your proverbial parsnips are buttered by the producers who are paying your check and will tell you, you have a fiduciary obligation to them. But as an artist, you feel a more profound obligation to the director for starters. And then, of course, sometimes you have directors who are more experienced than you and very often less experienced than you. And they may suggest something that you've seen or done before that you know in your bones as a creative artist won't work or won't function correctly. But part of your brief is that you are to serve them. But does service mean that you are uh, a syncophant? Or does service mean that you correct them when they're wrong? And if you correct them when they're wrong, are you subverting them as, say, an older man with a younger woman director, for example, and patronizing them that you know better? So understand this dynamic. I arrived on the set off a huge movie. I already had my ASC, American Society of Cinematographer Membership. Um, I, Patty was on her first movie as a director. Very low budget. They were underpaying me dramatically. And I arrived to start taking instructions from someone a few years out of the AFI Film Institute. And at first it was difficult for me because I thought I knew better about a lot of things. And some things technically I did know better about. And there were suggestions I would like to think, and I think Patty and Clark and, and uh, Charlize and everybody else would say that I did make a profound contribution. And 
Show you said at one time I saved the movie because it was shutting down before I got there. It's very sweet. But I had to learn a special measure of humility. And it was Buddhist like in that rediscovering your beginner's mind. And rather than presuming that your superior experience made you superior to affect a humility until you discovered a humility. So I said to myself, I have to serve Patty Jenkins, even though I am theoretically much more experienced than she is. And it took me a few days. And then I realized that I made the right choice because her intuitions, because very often they were intuitions, she didn't have the experience, were sound and brilliant and insightful and original and remarkable. So the more I surrendered uh, my ego, the more I discovered as an artist. It went so far as the photography itself. Cinematographer, we get paid to make beautiful, compelling, stunning images. We don't get paid, we think, to make grotty, documentary, handheld style images. But we should be because they're appropriate. And the more I talk to Patty about the nature of this character, the more Charlize and myself and the others talked about what the film was actually about, the more I realized that the visceral part of the movie was about decay. That the failing here was not of the individual, but of the society of which she was a part, which provided no support um, or solace for those who are disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And what Eileen Warnes became was an inevitable result of neglect. Doesn't mean that she isn't morally responsible for what she did, but still significant. Now, Patty was articulate enough to explain that to me and then harness my skills to facilitate her vision. And what I learned there, which I should have learned earlier, was you have to supplement, you have to subsume, I guess. You have to surrender your own vision to another person's vision first in a collaboration, and then discover those things you didn't know. If you believe and reinforce your own beliefs repeatedly, then you aren't open to change. And the best art comes from change. And you're more inclined to change by discovering a uh, humility and the presumption that you're coming to a new world with an innocence, uh, not actually proportional to your experience. You, uh, so going right into Eileen's world, uh, I think this is perfect. So, you know, you hear, you hear world building thrown around a lot. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, and you already kind of mentioned the, the visceral and, and the visual side of this, this world is, you know, Eileen's world. So I, I'm curious, I want to talk about your approach specifically to visualizing this world that you were trying to create with this story uh, and specifically Eileen's world. So capturing a, a world in, in a, you know, biographical film like this one, it often requires this blend of uh, realism and cinematic flair uh, to, to make things come to life. And, and even the contrast between things like you know, intimate close-ups and, and wider shots can be this like really instrumental uh, device in, in, uh, in showing this kind of duality of this character's world like Eileen's. So considering Monster was shot on a modest budget, uh, what were your primary considerations as the cinematographer for visually capturing the essence of Eileen's world? Yeah, again, a great question. It goes to three things that I have to do as a cinematographer. You have to tell the story, the visual story. So I've got to do uh, a master shot, maybe I'll show the geography, physicality, close-ups to capture performance. Someone's saying something, probably one on camera most of the time. We want a reaction shot maybe to what those people say. If there's inserts that are significant, um, one, one time we were shooting in a, a, a bar called The Last Resort where the real Eileen Warnes used to drink. 
And we had a scene when Charlie's on the telephone and we're going to have her walk away from the telephone and we're going to push in to the wall and see a brick there because each brick, someone will write a message um, about their time at the last resort. So there are hundreds of mm -hmm. bricks on this back wall outside and all these people have written, got drunk here, um, you know, hate this place, destroy the place. And we know that we knew that Eileen drank there, so we looked everywhere for her, her brick. Couldn't find it. We gave it up. So now we're shooting Charlie, I'm pretending to be Eileen Rose, by this phone. It still gives me chills. And Charlie walks out of the shot. Now I'm hand holding. One of the reasons I'm hand holding is we want to create that sense that it's almost like a documentary. And there's something about when a camera's being handheld, because we associate it with news reporting. We think reportage, we think it's documentary like, which means it's more real and it's more real. It's more terrifying because it doesn't seem something staged. So that's why we're hand holding. Same token, we want this to be a world of menace and fear, like a horror film. So I would, I had those floating lights, certainly, but I also had some hard top lights, which we traditionally use in horror film because it creates severe contrast. Things burning out here, not lit as well there. When you drop the face down, the face drops into shadow like a monster, literally like a monster. So we're using hard top light as well. That's the storytelling. But as I was saying before, there's also the sense that we wanted an object correlative, to use the term for literature that the film was about social decay. So we wanted to have a sense of a physical decay in the world all around her. Now, saturated colors are not associated with decay, right? Reds, greens, new paint jobs, etc. But pastels are associated with decay. So I used soft lighting, indirect lighting, which reduces color saturation and that would make the colors look more like pastels, like they were faded. With the art department, whenever we would paint a surface, we would paint it with a faded color. And then we would age it. We would take literally dirt mixed with water in a spray can and then spray it to age it down. We would take wallpaper where it was and we intensely peel it off. We would um, include lights in the frame that were fluorescence at the end of their life. So they would flicker um, slightly. Uh, whenever we have an abandoned car, we would include and hold that in the frame. So everything you looked at is sort of things where, were you driving from the airport in some, some small faraway town? If that's the neighborhood you're driving from, you would think, I can't wait to get to my hotel. And that's what we wanted to have that sense of. And the same thing with our wardrobe. Uh, everybody was wearing tattered, stained, old clothes, nothing look new or polished or French from the sh fresh from the shop. Even I remember the glasses in the bar, uh, Patty had the, the props people dirty them up. So if you got served a shot, you were sh served with a dirty glass, small things that created this visceral world. So in the middle of all this, we had this idea that I wanted to tie Charlize to the physical space that she was in, and we we're gonna have her exit the frame and then push into these bricks with all these messages on them, um, just to sense, get this tawdry nature of people living in like one of Dante's lower rings of hell, but writing messages to an uncaring world, messages to nobody, uh, messages in a bottle that wash forever in the sea. Uh, nobody's listening. Nobody is listening. And those messages to me were messages sent to a world that didn't care what the poor uh, in this dive of a bar had to say. What was magical about this moment, Charlize, leaves, we roll the focus onto the brick that was directly behind her and unbeknownst to her, that was the missing brick. That was the real Eileen Warnes's brick. And we rolled it to it. It came into focus, I thought my heart was going to stop and it said, I, Eileen Warnes was raped. Now, obviously we couldn't use that shot because our fake Eileen Warnes was just exited the frame and hadn't read anything on the wall. But that was just one of those strange moments in a movie that happens that chilled the blood. When, th when something like that happens, do you like as a crew and as, as a collective, do you, do you, um, 
<laughs> what happens? How did y'all like, do y'all talk about that? Like, was it, was it just it something was, that you noticed? It was very strange in the movie throughout. There's so many things like that happen. We were having trouble finding a location to use as a holding cell for, uh, the Eileen Warner's Charlie's with Patrain. And we, we found this local police station that had a holding cell in it. And while we we're shooting there, uh, the guy said, what are you guys shooting? Because, you know, that cell's famous. And we said, why? Well, you know, when Eileen Warnes was arrested for the first time, we put her in that cell. Do you guys know who Eileen Warnes is? And we said, yeah, it's what happens. We're making a film about her. It was lots of things like that happened on this film. Strange and, and happy uh, coincidences and grim coincidences as well. One of the more remarkable things going to this idea of decay and rot you know, rot comes from humidity and rain and moisture, and that's what Central Florida is all about. Our last day of shooting, we found through our location manager this wonderful amusement park, which was as tawdry as you could imagine. The sort of toilets, which are the, um, the porta potties, and there's a hole in the ground, and you have all the people have evacuated and the body sitting. It's that sort of feel for it. Every ride is, is worse than the last. The colors are all faded. Um, the food served there is, is diabolical. The people who are the habitats are come from the poorest part of the community. And Patty got there and was inspired by it, and it began to rain. How perfect. Because throughout the shoot, what you normally don't want is rain. But we wanted rain because we wanted to get that sense of rot and decay. And at every key moment in the film, seeing when Charlize and Christina first go driving together right after one of the major murders are feeling very much in love. Um, in the back, uh, where the, we have special mount in the back of the, 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 the car, looking through the window, and I see the two of them in a two shot, and the rain comes. So the rain's pounding on the window, and the windshield wipers are going, and I lean out to the side of the car, and um, uh, Christina has put her hand out of the window. And then she begins playing with the wind um, and the camera just sits on her hand. Uh, again, this sense of these people who are trying to live a normal life in an abnormal world, to find some connection with another human being in a world that's entirely indifferent um, to, their, to their fates. It was powerful. And in the amusement park, we get Christina and Charlize on a Ferris wheel and it's just, it won't bear the weight of more than theoretically three people. In fact, it wouldn't bear the weight of three people. So the thing, it's raining, things be going, going up, and it's got a, a drive belt. And the drive belt is getting wetter and wetter. And I've got a two shot of Christina and, and Charlize. And suddenly we feel the Ferris wheel go, and we hear a, a squeer, squealing sound. And then it catches again and starts going up. And so they keep acting and all three of us oh, wow. were certain that we were about to die, but what a wonderful energy <laughs> it, 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 it provided because literally in the story, one of them is about to die and the other one is about to have her life sort of destroyed. Um, and it was remarkable. But again, this idea of finding objective correlatives, sure. There was dialogue and there was a story. But when you see that tawdry amusement park with its garish or its bleached or its washed out colors and the peeling paints and the old signage and the failed neon, what you sense is rot. And right away, through no great reach, you have an understanding of the corruption that these of the world that these characters inhabit. And I think that was kind of magical. So to tell a story with camera, absolutely. To then create the symbolism um, or the, the visceral landscape. So the audience has a better understanding not only of the action, but of the characters and the big philosophic conceits that Patty was undertaking to gently and subtly illustrate. That was my job, and we achieved it through these mechanisms. It's really important for a director to say to a cinematographer what they're looking for, because that moment when I got Christina's hand was entirely my intuition, but only my intuition because Patty had created for me 
an understanding of what her film was about and how she wanted the images to serve that story. That's incredible because that, I mean, we just watched the trailer, that, that clip or that, uh, that scene is in her hand out the window. I mean, that's even in the trailer. I mean, that's such a significant piece of that. Ah, wow. That's fantastic. Very, very cool. And I mean, you obviously did your job because you can, I remember watching it last night and I was just kind of taking some, some notes as I was watching it. And one of the things that stood out is you could, you can feel the, the grit in that movie. Like you feel not dirty almost like in, in certain aspects watching that just because of the, you know, the, the environment that they're in. It's, it's, yeah, that's incredible. Same thing with Charlie under the bridge, which is the famous iconic image from the movie where she's sitting by herself under, uh, you know, on, on, the, on the bridge uh, support and she's in silhouette. Um, we were driving along, it was pissing down with rain again, and we saw this great bridge and we didn't have a generator. We had no way of getting lights there. So if I had exposed for Charlize on the bridge, it would have been blown out outside. The film would not have tolerated that much of a rain. Shot on the film, by the way. So we thought it was cooler that we simply photographed the rain with Charlize in the foreground in silhouette, much influenced by another film you and know, I've talked about called Days of Heaven. I, mm. beginning of the film opens with a big silhouette and I thought this was kind of a great homage to that, but very different rather than something of hope and glory and, and great uh, promise. This is about the absence of promise and shot this silhouette shot um, out into the, the, uh, the wilderness beyond with rain, with her just sitting there trying to dry off entirely in silhouette a big emotional moment, but also, you know, I've, I've, uh, there's a Carl Casper Frederick is a uh, German expressionist painter that influenced this movie and influenced me in a big way. The idea of trying to convey depression and sadness in a frame. I'm always aware of story as a cinematographer, as a director, but I also feel I have my own story to tell that is the subtext of the movie. And so as I look at lighting and composition and camera movement and Exposure. If you underexpose motion picture film and then print it up, it gets very grainy. So I underexposed all of Monster intentionally and printed it up so it get grainy. But what I was trying to convey that this is a depressed and sad world. And I was doing that with use of color, with composition, with camera movement, with filters and with lights. And it served the film's shared and greater purpose. Okay, you you've you've touched on realism already, and uh, that's a big that's a big piece that I that I'd love to talk about, uh, which is incorporating realism into this type of film. So, realism in cinematography it often involves this kind of delicate balance of this like authentic representation, but also you know balancing the, the overall film's vision. Uh, so, in a film like Monster, I'm curious how you, uh, as the cinematographer, uh, worked to maintain the balance between that realism and cinematic storytelling? Yeah, it's a tricky one because I'm, I'm a iconoclast by nature, at least I hope I am, and particularly about orthodoxies to do with filmmaking. So I'm generally not sure what objective reality is, even in my own life experience, but certainly in the cinema universe. Is it a perfectly photographed image with a camera mounted on a dolly, beautifully exposed, camera pushing in, revealing moment of heightened emotion that finishes in a big close up? Let's think about that because if we measure film's reality by comparison to our ordinary world, how often at moments of heightened emotion do we run up to someone's face, the equivalent of a big close up, and look right into their eyes? Hmm. I don't think we do that. How often at a moment of high drama do we wrap around from behind a person's head and go into a silhouette of a profile? Not very often. And in fact, the way the eye works is no matter how much we move our head, the eye stabilizes the image. It's so the idea that a handheld shaking camera replicates our experience of the world is inaccurate. Hmm. We see the world as stable. It's only the camera that's unstable. So people will use a handheld and say they want to make it real, but they're making it less real. What they're doing is imitating 
as I said before, documentary or news um, reportage. And we associate that with things that are real, but it's not a portrayal of the real. Same thing with editing. When we're in a conversation with someone, we don't go from close up to close up and close up and see our own faces and see their faces. Um, we don't have music in our world where we're talking to someone and we admit to our beloved that we love them and suddenly there's an orchestra in our living room. That doesn't um, happen. There aren't visual effects in our world. There aren't titles in our world. How strange it is to have the beginning of the movie that we see titles across images. All those things bear no correspondence to the ordinary world, but they're recognized devices that we use in motion pictures. So my view about all filmmaking is that it's by its nature surreal. And therefore, there are no limits to what you can do, as long as you don't take the audience out of the story. And that really has to do with entering into a social contract with the audience about what will be portrayed as believable in this particular cinematic world and won't be. So in Monster, um, we did Shot in the Rain, absolutely. We did silhouette shots, we did the shot of the hand and so on. But if you look at the film generally, it seems like something that you might have experienced, not in the real world, but in a documentary because of the production design, because of the way the camera's used and the way it's cut. There's music in the film. There's titles, of course, subsequently. There's editing. There's push and lots of push and shots. Um, a lot of wraparound shots, even a couple of crane shots, um, even some green screen. But it's done in such a way that it doesn't pull you out of the film. But it's not to say that a different film in another context like Aliens, which is actually, I think, very realistic, although I've got <laughs> limited experience of Aliens, but it's shot in such a way that you believe the alien could exist. And if you mm -hmm. believe that something could exist, then you as a viewer are more inclined to be moved emotionally, intellectually by whatever story is, um, is presented. Um, and I think that part of that phantasmagorical element is to do with the central relationship between Christina and Charlize. People could say, had it been shot or directed differently, how could this girl fall in love with this woman? But Patty makes it very simple because within the context of their limited world, each person seeking some comfort from a companion seems the most natural and organic thing that could possibly happen. And something that even though it is in this world that's different from our own, we can recognize our own experience of life in it. Who amongst us haven't loved someone just because they had a need to love and be loved in our turn? We don't always love because we actually are in love, but because we need to love. And that's part of what the story is about, is the need is an overwhelming thing even if the circumstances would suggest it couldn't possibly happen. This is good. I thought it was going to be a bigger shift, but I would like to talk about emotional depth uh, on the back of that. So specifically capturing emotional depth. Uh, so the, you know, assuming a cinematographer's ability to capture these, these kind of like subtle nuances of an actor's performance uh, can significantly uh, enhance the emotional impact of a film at times. And uh, not to get into the weeds too much, but even using things like specific lenses and, and lighting techniques can actually help focus the audience attention uh, on the you know emotional state of a character at times. So assuming Shirley Theron's transformation uh, into Eileen required, I would assume this close collaboration with you and your team as the cinematographer to really capture these things. How did, I'm curious how you personally, uh, worked towards, you know, ensuring that the cinematography actually effectively conveyed the depth of the performance that she was, that she was putting out there. Cause this, I mean, you know, one of the biggest things about this film is the transformation that she had uh, as an actor. Well, the first thing is to, in, in homage to that is to Charlie's made such a sacrifice to make herself appear that way, that the way we lit her had to facilitate that. So as I said, it was hard top lighting, sometimes hard side lighting. Uh, a lot of light in the green, green blue register to take the life out of the skin to make her look as kind of nasty and horrible as we possibly could. 
That was the first thing because that's what she wanted. And that's what Patty wanted was mm -hmm. we want to make a love story about someone who wasn't attractive because that's the only way to get to the essence of the ideas that Patty was pursuing. So that's what we did, first of all. Second thing is there's certain principles that I just follow about how to facilitate performance. It's tempting sometimes to shoot only one actor's eye if they're in a profile. It seems natural. You're in a particular position, it's less work, and it may be organic to where they've positioned themselves. But my belief is that the performance is in the eyes. So in all my films, particularly this movie, I would always find my way to work around so I would get both eyes of the performance. Also, I have a rule that I don't like to use anything much more, more than a medium close-up. But in this film, I used much bigger close-ups than I normally would because I thought that the interior life of this character was hugely important. And Charlize's performance was so subtle and nuanced that you had to be close to see it because she wasn't doing a lot, sometimes just the movement of the eyes. But I wanted the audience to be intimate with her so they could love her because it seems an anomaly that she could be loved because she's a monster. But that's the irony of the title. There but for the grace of God go all of us. And if she's a monster, then all of us are because we have human need as she does, desire for connection and love as she does. And unfortunately, because she had been abandoned, abused, and was in an uncaring, indifferent, and decaying world, her behavior ultimately, of course, was abhorrent. But it has a logic to it when you consider the source of her considerable mental illness, but also her mm. considerable need. And also subtle camera movements. What a lot of audiences don't realize is that a very small move in to a close up makes the audience feel at some unconscious level, because they've been conditioned to believe this, but also it goes to the actual physical nature of the camera moving closer, that something dramatic is happening, something of greater emotional import. So at key moments of one of Charlize's or Christina's, one of the other characters' speeches or conversations, I would always introduce, having looked and examined the script and stuff with Patty, the moment when the camera would move in. Because there's always the sense that everything, particularly in the second half of the film, is a heightened emotional timber. And I want to facilitate that subtly because audiences don't notice it. But when it happens, there's a kind of a sharp intake of breath, like something significant has occurred. That we just moved in very close and sometimes just be a look and the camera pushes forward and the audience feels something. But if you ask them what just happened, they couldn't say the camera moved forward. And that's what I mean about subtle visceral manipulation uh, that is an objective relative <laughs> interior life of the character. Okay, this is good. So uh, speaking of kind of cameras and, and equipment, um, I'm curious about technical choices uh, as a cinematographer and, and how it affects things. So I'm curious what some of the key equipment or, or technical decisions that you made were that significantly impacted the actual visual style of Monster. Well, one of the things that goes hand in hand with this gritty location work um, that we were that we we're employing is the grittiness of the film. Again, we think about associations. I said before that the handheld we associate with news, but oddly, so much of what we've seen in documentary, behind the scenes or hidden cameras, is very grainy. You can see the it used to be film grain, now it's electronic grain, because the cameras are a lower quality. They had to be smaller. And we associate that with the genuine, even though, of course, as I said before, the way our eyes work is they're not shaking and they're not grainy, but grainy film we associated with object reality for whatever reason. And I wanted this grainy look. So we were shooting on film and digital hadn't come around yet, but I chose a high speed film because high speed films are grainier. It also means that I could use more available light don't really use available light much because I want to affect light. I want to control it. But still, the fill light, the, just the base level, would be natural to whatever location we're in. And then I would intentionally underexpose the film a lot, which means it would come out too dark. 
which means when we went to the laboratory in post-production, we print it up. And by printing up, you're damaging in a way the film, the quality of the film. And it gets very grainy. The colors desaturate, the grain increases, and it makes everything look a little bit filthy, like a 16 millimeter, dare I say, pornographic film of the 1970s. Mm. And that's what we were going for and achieved it. So not only do you have a sense of decay in the locations we chose and what the art department did to the surfaces, but the film itself looked decayed and tawdry and rotted. That's so cool. Uh, we, you talked about locations a bit. Um, so I'm curious about working in real locations as opposed to sets. Uh, because my understanding is it can present, you know, these unique challenges. It's not a contained environment. It's, there's a lot of other elements involved that you have to, that you have to work around. So, uh, <laughs> I also saw that this was shot in 28 days. So considering the film was shot in 28 days, uh, and often in practical locations, not sets. What were the scenes in Monster that presented the biggest challenges for you from a cinematography perspective? Uh, and how did you approach those? A couple. Um, one was the, um, they go in one hiding place and it was in a, uh, we found this location before I got there that was cheap and available because cheap and available were two of the greatest virtues for any location <laughs> on a film that small. And it had a tin roof. And it was a curved tin roof and it was low. And the three days before and right after the, the day of the shoot were incredibly humid and very, very hot. I think the temperature indoors was running about 110, 112 degrees Fahrenheit and very, very humid. And my uh, camera assistant um, was looking pale to me. I didn't know quite why. And then suddenly after about the third take of a push and shot where Charlie said something very significant and we were rolling the camera in and we were rolling the focus to hold the focus on her face and getting very, very close. Um, suddenly, um, she just, Paige just fell over and, um, had, uh, heat stroke and we had to rush her to, um, hospital. So that was kind of remarkable, but typical of a lot of the shoot in intense humidity, which I think contributed to the performance. I mean, see the stain and the sweat on the clothes and, um, very often, Patty would insist that we wouldn't do, redo the makeup so we could get that sense of real um, perspiration and heat, which went to this idea of a missile tube, that this was genuine and real and not a contrived uh, Hollywood version of events. Mm-hmm. And then there was this famous skating scene, uh, famous one, skating scene uh, in a skate park. Um, and again, this curved roof, I don't know what it was about Orlando that liked curved roof, which is a nightmare for a cinematographer because sure, at the, at the apex, there's plenty of room to hide lights, but because it's curved when it gets down around the bottom, the ceiling is in the shot. So if you put a light there, the audience will see it. So I walked in and I had not scouted this location because I joined the film this late to come save it theoretically. And I walked in this location and uh, Ted Hayish, my gaffer, and I looked at it and we said, uh, hmm, this is impossible to light because our lights will be in the shot. And we thought about it and thought about it. And we came up with a solution. You only come up on a low budget film in a hurry. There are things called bats, which are pieces of wood. Um, and you put just the lighting fixtures on the top, the little sockets the light goes into. You then run the cables along those bats. You put light, like four light bulbs and you've got a light, very rudimentary light, just bulbs. And we thought maybe the skating rink, uh, had decorated their entire building with light bulbs and it's part of their, their design. So we got hundreds and hundreds of light bulbs, pieces of wood and every electrician we could find. And we drilled these fixtures into the wood and then we got ladders and ropes and all the rest of it. And we put lights all along the arches and right down into the shop. So the thing would be illuminated. And we were very proud of ourselves now. They, the lights would be in the shop, but they look like decorations and entirely natural. And then what we would do with Charlize and Christina as they skated was my um, grip, um, Vidal Cohen, had designed a little cart, put small skate wheels on the bottom. The camera would sit on this cart and there'd be three grips um, that would run around and push the cart with the camera on it in front of Christina and Charlize as they skated. And 
we're going to do it all in one shot. There's going to be um, Steve Perry uh, was going to sing that song that he sings at that moment on the mm -hmm. soundtrack, and they're going, we're going to see them falling in love. And it was getting really hot in there because the lights and because it was a tin roof again, and there were a lot of people and extras, and you're all ready to shoot. And uh, Patty came over, and the producer had spoke to Marley about our, our solution, and we were very proud. And suddenly we heard poop, and we heard glass falling. And then we heard poop and glass falling. The heat had gotten so intense that molten glass from these lights was falling onto the actors and the extras as one light after another began to shatter above us. And we had no choice but to watch it. We watched it for about 15 minutes. And I thought, oh my God, have I gotten this wrong? And then for some reason, um, whatever happened, or whatever bulbs that we got from different manufacturers, the popping and the breaking stopped. We waited, we swept up the broken glass, and we shot the sequence. And it's <laughs> the more legendary sequence, this sort of film of this film, everyone talks about it. And mm. we see them dancing together in the, on their skates. We're rolling with in front of them all in one shot. And they go outside and they have a passionate kiss. And again, mm. we set the exterior up in like 15 minutes. I just lit the background, let the foreground drop in the silhouette. We had some people wander through the shot, look at them as they, they make out, and it was magic. And that whole sequence, the actual shooting, was only a few hours. The setting up took a lot longer. But that's low-budget filmmaking. Uh, the risks, the dangers, the excitement, and the thrill of coming up spontaneously with solutions to seemingly insuperable problems. Uh, you know, very exciting. It's kind of at that point that, point that we all began to realize we were on to something and something very special was happening uh, on that film. And I talked before about this kind of virus of virtue that had spread through the crew and everyone was getting into it. We had a dolly grip who was big, broad shouldered, enormous guy with tattoos, scared the hell out of me, but pushed a good dolly. <laughs> and um, the next day, I think it was two or three days later, we were shooting the scene where Christina and Charlie's were saying goodbye to each other. They both know the other betrayed them in some way and they're, they're going to say goodbye. And it was a big emotional moment. And normally with crews, crews are kind of cynical very often to the working part of the crews. They've seen it all before, kind of vaguely aware of what's happening, but not interested. This big grip came up to me and he said, uh, well, it's really incredible what Charlie's and Christine are doing. Is it us? So I wonder, you know, maybe if the crew was like silent when they were working, just let them concentrate. Crews are not silent. We're yelling, we're shouting, cables are being drawn. Um, lots going on. And it's not efficient for it to be silent, but he thought of this. We talked about it amongst the crew and we decided that no one would speak at all on the set. So when the actors arrived, it was the strangest thing rather than the noisy mechanisms that you normally hear on a film set of shouting and yelling and drilling and hammering. Silence. Christina and Charlie took the position, silence. We'd be gesturing, gesturing to my camera system, to the grip, to the crew. We'd be pointing, nothing. They began doing this scene of confessing their love to each other against the wall. And like I said before, for dramatic emphasis, subtle, unconscious dramatic evidence, uh, dramatic uh, emphasis, the camera would push in on the track closer and closer and closer as their passion um, and the tragedy of the denouement of the relationship was realized. Complete silence. And there's a synergy that happens between crew and actors, which most people don't realize. What was magical early in the film about the hand holding and the moving lights was that Charlize could run with her intuitions and the performance is wholly organic to her individual personhood and understanding of the character. But now we'd gone one step further and we were no longer functioning simply as professionally, but as a synergetic extension of those performances. And we facilitated them and the performances were magical. And we were all moved by this moment of tragedy as you rarely are as an artist or technician on the set. Dead silence, except I began to hear a sniffling. Someone was crying. 
And I was very worried that the microphone would pick it up. And I looked to the camera and Charlize wasn't crying. Not till later, Christina wasn't crying, looked around. And then I turned around and looked at the house that was my dolly grip, who was moving the dolly, this huge, tattooed, terrifying individual. Tears streaming down his face as he watched the performance. Now, those events happen rarely in film, but when they do, they are magical. And it goes to why we make film. Mm. Why we gather together and collaborate and genuinely try to discover transcendent nature that we share, that we can observe in character and other characters, but also in each other, because a film set is a crucible of endless tension where your metal as a human, as a creative artist, as a collaborator are tested. And if you can survive it emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, then you are a better and more evolved person. And the product of your labor is better and more significant. And that's what happened on that film. Are you able to, I mean, 28 days is such a short amount of time to get all of that done. When those things happen in that, that kind of environment and that, that type of experience in the moment, are you able to realize it and, and be like connected to what's going on? Or is it just, there's so much going on that you have to move on to the next thing? Well, at, that, at that moment we were, but the, in the evenings we gather together sometimes one night, like four o'clock in the morning, having a long conversation with Charlie, so just about life in general, and she couldn't sleep. And none of us sleep in that hotel. The, what was in those mattresses was terrifying. So we'd often wake at night, just like worried about what, what was biting us and what was attacking us. Uh, Patty and I would talk about a lot of things. Um, I remember when the shoot finished at that amusement park and the, the built up emotions of the entire crew. I've never seen so many people not at a funeral crying at the same time. But it wasn't yeah. the, the, the crying of grief. It was because we had built such a bond that we knew that it would never be repeated. That's the sadness of the last day of any shoot is that the family that you've created, you know, you'll never see again in that context together. So there's that sadness, the sense that we'd achieved something special and magical, the sacrifices we've seen each other make. Um, all that, um, came to the, uh, came to the fore for sure. Um, but in the moment, do you realize what's happening? Not wholly and real, not always certainly wholly. And you're under such pressure on a short schedule that you're really only thinking about what you can achieve that day. I know at one point near the end of the shoot, we had to do about 28 setups in a day. Big feature, you average about 11, maybe setups, maybe eight or nine, maybe five or six, 28 impossible. And really it was close to 38 because it was shot in reverse. So a lot of people said, just give it up. Patty's got to cut something. And at this point, Patty and I were not taking any prisoners. If we're not giving anything up, we're going to achieve this. So we combined the locations. The locations were in like four different places. We were going to cheat some shots that were meant to be behind the building. We found a wall that could cheat for that building. Another part was meant to be in a forest. There's some forest in a clearing near that building. We're going to shoot that and cheat it there. Uh, another part was meant to be a fire that happened earlier in the film. We we're going to be close to the fire. We cheated there and we lined all these up. I put the camera on my shoulder. Um, even though I said to my operator, stand by, but I, I just going to have to figure this out as I go without any planning. We got those lights up on those, um, paper lanterns on the fish poles and we began to run, set up, shoot, spin the camera back, get the reverse done. No second take next set up pan. Close up, zoom in, get that detail done. We did 41 setups in six hours and virtually every one of them is in the movie and they work. So, and by the way, talk about schedules. Um, GRQ was way less than 28 days and people look at it and they say, Oh, it took three months to make this. You got so much going on, green screen effects and so on. No, we had no money, very little money. Uh, we built a set, we had some groups, we had some locations, and then I've become kind of uh, this 
savant in terms of using multiple cameras. So I've done it so often on SWAT, on Monster, on White Chicks, on so many other movies. Because I'm a great believer in getting shot and reaction at the same time and getting your master. And if you use long enough lenses and you light in such a way, you don't have to compromise your lighting. But by using multiple cameras, you get more organic performances, good action and reaction from actors at the same time. So using those um, multiple cameras on GRQ, um, we were able to get, you know, 40 setups, 50 setups a day and shoot in, I don't want to say how few because people won't think the film's good, but way less than 28 days and finished early every single day. So it's doable. And I'd go so far, and what the actor said to me subsequently and the, the crew members is there's a great advantage to shooting quickly and it concentrates the mind and focus the actors and makes things better. So it started kind of with Monster, uh, maybe a little bit before, but it's a methodology I've employed a lot and I think it contributes mightily to the quality of the film. Okay, so this this is great. This takes me to kind of the last question I have. Um, and, you know, again, this film is different than the other, uh, the other ones that we'll be talking about just because of your involvement. So, this this film is based on a true story, right? And I think it's the only one that that we're that we're going to be watching and talking about that is based on a true story. Uh, and films based on true stories they often require, and you've already pointed to this, extensive research, uh, which can help contribute to the filmmaker's understanding of of just the subject matter in general of, of what the story they're trying to tell. So, considering that Monster was this significant project in Patty Jenkins' early career. And likely, I would assume, a learning experience for the entire crew, uh, based on everything that you're saying. Uh, were there any moments during production that were significant to you, either personally or professionally, from a growth and learning perspective? I do think that my learning humility was important, but then also my learning that I have to subsume those things that would best serve my career to better serve the film. So rather than trying to make Shirley's beautiful and the image is beautiful and every movement elegant and uh, be thinking Oscars uh, with a movie, I instead had to do the opposite of all those things to employ a lot of mechanisms to make the audience feel the things we want them to feel without making it obvious to them that we were manipulating them. And that was an important lesson. I also recognize from that movie that total commitment and integrity, creative integrity, was more important to me than I realized. I started this discussion with you about how depressed I was on SWAT. Not because the people on SWAT weren't good people, the film wasn't great. I'm very proud of my associations on that and I'm very proud of the movie. But it had to do with, I shouldn't have been there at that particular moment. I was interested in exploring bigger ideas about our human nature, about creative process, about integrity, about the nature of depression, about the nature of relationships, all the things I would subsequently go on to explore as a writer and director, I was already profoundly interested in much earlier. But I couldn't find a way to express that entirely through cinematography. I actually began before I was a cinematographer, as a writer director, and then became a cinematographer. And then I realized about the time I did Monster that I had to get back to what I had done before. I had to find a more effective platform for me to express the ideas that I want to express. So it was life-changing for me because I realized that I had to direct after doing that film. And I realized I had to go back to writing, not just books or novels. I wanted to make my own films, although I had avoided it because I found directing so very difficult and kind of soul destroying because it takes so long to get a film made there's so many compromises you have to make and it might never happen so i said well not to worry i've got another film lined up it's called decoding annie parker it's a script i wrote with my son it's everything's there i've got an investor 
okay, I'm going to go back to directing, but I'm going to get together in a couple of months and shoot it. Seven years later, seven years later, we were shooting our first day. All those years of raising money, losing money, getting money, getting cast, losing cast, finding cast. So everything that I was frightened of, I ended up doing, but glad I made the transition because as much as I love all the things we're talking about, about cinematography, and as much as the understanding of the visceral and the visual still informs every single day I'm on set as a director, to be in control of all things, including the performances and the scripts, allows me as an artist much more creative flexibility and ultimately more edifying for me and hopefully for my audiences. Hmm. God, that is beautiful. Okay, let's, whew. that was a lot, that's good. But I, I've been looking forward to this piece just because again, it's so unique because you were involved in this. It is trivia time. Ah, I and the <laughs> my approach to this, this time, I'm, I'm I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what you're going to know and then what's going to be kind of a, a surprise or even what's true or not, because <laughs> you're obviously somebody that can, that can, uh, they can answer that. So, uh, apparently, uh, Patty Jenkins in preparation for this, uh, actually received hundreds of letters from Eileen, uh, like actual letters from her, uh, that she had written, uh, and received these in order to gain like insight into Eileen's life during writing, which is again, the, you, you you talk about creative process so much and, and approach to things, but that like little pieces like that to me is just so fascinating because the idea of Patty Jenkins sitting there wherever she was with these letters from someone like Eileen and then taking that and putting that into story, the process of that just, I mean, what that does to someone, it just has to be an incredible experience alone, let alone making the film. I, I it was before I joined, I heard the story. I believe it to be true. Um, I must ask Patty sometime, but I know that they were in, in contact in some respect. And, um, uh, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult because the Eileen of Patty's film isn't necessarily the Eileen that existed. And people mm. lose track of this about Oppenheimer, about virtually any other film is that films are artistic representations of the essence of something, not the thing itself. So because something's based on a true story, doesn't mean it is a true story. And what an artist does is extract, reshape, and present the essence of an idea to affect and influence audience rather than simply report what actually occurred. That would be a documentary. So I think, in even in Decoding Annie Parker, which is based on real people, or the film I did something about Dylan Thomas, I got one review that said, yeah, the way Bernstein portrays this didn't actually happen. Okay. Um, it may not have happened, but I'm not interested in what happened. I'm interested in the nature uh, at the heart of this character. And that, to my mind, is genuine because it's the fruit and product of my own creative imagination that has been inspired by a real person. <laughs> There's one that I'm saving for last. Okay, so Charlize Theron, she obviously won um, the Academy Award for this for this role, uh, but apparently she won the award on February 29th of 2004, which was Eileen's birthday. That sounds like one of the coincidences that went to go to the nature of this this film. This, the tragic coincidence is the profound one. Uh, um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of sadness around this movie and a lot of joy as well. Remember when she got this film, this film that went on to win an Oscar and make so much money, she couldn't get anyone to buy it. Nobody liked the film. Nobody thought it was good. No one thought that anyone would go to see a film about a serial killer. And she did sell it. And uh, originally it was Blockbuster. And Blockbuster said, yeah, we'll just, we'll just a couple of pretty girls is uh, seeing where they're making out. Um, you know, we'll sell it in, a, in, in a, a special display inside Blockbuster. And then Patty and Charlize pushed very hard and said, we'll only do this if you give us a limited theatrical. She a couple of screens and Blockbuster said, oh, well, all right, if you give us something in exchange, they gave up some holding or back end or money. And they put it in this one cinema in New York and one in Los Angeles. And there was a line outside the cinema. And then a bigger line the second day and a bigger line the third day. And the line was around the block. And then it was five cinemas, then 10, then 15, then 40. 
60, 80, 100, 200, 300, 740 screens, I think it finished at. And that little tiny movie shot in 28 days made an awful lot of money and won an Oscar or Golden Globe and uh, was one of the most celebrated films of the five years previous and five years after. So you just never know. But the fact that um, Patty and Charlize and everybody else made this remarkable film and then no one would buy it or put it in distribution was a remarkable thing. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, all right. And last one. Uh, and I'm curious what your thoughts, just writer, director, all the things. Apparently, uh, Patty Jenkins wrote this screenplay in seven weeks and production was set up in two months. Now, I know you came in, uh, I guess, after that point. But is that uh, that seems spot, fast spot spot now? Almost accurate. I mean, um, she was uh, was around before that trying to get cash. She had to get Charlize. But once Charlize was on board, which was very early, then everything went very, very quickly. I can't um, go to the veracity of those exact dates, but I know it went extremely quickly because uh, Brad Wyman, who was one of the original producers, Clark, um, Charlize and Patty all worked around the clock to put this thing together in a, in a record hurry because, as I say, usually... Films take two, five, six, seven years. It was quick. Oh, Stephen, this was a joy. Uh, that's all I have. So any uh, any closing thoughts on this? Just for anyone um, in life, how was I to know that I went from SWAT, which made a lot of money, to a little movie in Florida, which seemed destined for nothing? Same thing happened to me on Water for Chocolate. I came over to finish another cinematographer's work and it was very obvious this film was never going to get released they didn't have the money the shoot was chaos and became the highest grossing foreign language film of all time um i did a little film uh about some guys smoking dope up in canada um comedians done like sketch comedy and everyone at the time thought it was kind of a terrible movie it became half-baked kind of this huge cult film white chicks um a movie that was kind of farcical and that was going to do okay it has become one of the biggest cult films of its nature of all time. Unknown actor appears in it named Terry Crews, does this crazy improv improvised dance, and knocks it uh, out of the park and becomes very, very famous. Uh, it goes on and on. You don't know when you begin a film how it's going to finish. You don't know what's going to be successful and what isn't. You, We all want to plan our lives and our careers thinking that there's some certainty in our imagination, that there's a mechanism, kind of like AI, that you put in information and it will give you the correct answer. But there isn't a correct answer. There is no certainty. The only certainty is that there is constant change. And the zeitgeist changes, the nature of the film you're working on changes, and you don't know how it's going to come out. But if there's a lesson in all this, in all the films I've worked on over this long career now, it's perseverance, that you just keep doing and making and hoping. And sometimes you'll succeed for no good reason. And sometimes you'll fail despite doing some of your best work. But the joy of filmmaking is you extract something of value, as I did from Monster, from every single thing you do. It builds character, it builds sentient understanding of other people's suffering and the individualism with which they look at the world. It gives you a perspective that you wouldn't have if you did virtually anything else. It is a collective art form which requires not only your own keen insight, but for you to collaborate with others on having a reckoning about what your film's about and how the film's gonna be made and how you can best facilitate others and how you can get others to best facilitate you. So it teaches you about human interaction and about creating success from virtually nothing, like doing a film in 28 days in the humidity of Florida.